All right, today we're going to look at John chapter 1 and considering the advent of Jesus Christ according to the Gospel of John. Now the word advent means simply coming. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ according to the Gospel of John. So this advent, this is what we're going to look at. John's message about the coming of Jesus and what that means for us. So uh, as we begin today, we're going to look at John chapter 1. Uh, please pray with me as we get into the Word this morning. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, Holy Spirit, open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, open our hearts that we may receive your Word today. May we get a greater glimpse of the glory of God through the Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, through the hearing and the receiving and the living of your Word. And it's in Jesus' name today that we pray. Amen. Amen. The prologue to John begins this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And he came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God, today. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So, I was over at Alice's a couple of days ago, a few days ago, and uh, Joetta was over there about the same time, and I got there a little after she did, I guess. And we were visiting, and then pretty soon after that, the home health care nurse came, and then... Uh, there was a gas man also there to fill up Alice's propane tank. And a little bit after that, as I was leaving, the surf pro guy was coming. So we just had a big old time there at Alice's house. Uh, but the, the propane guy was there to fill up the tank, and uh, she only uses the propane to, the, to fuel the gas logs that she has in her living room. So they haven't been lit in a while, so she asked him to come in to see if he could get them lit, get the pilot light on. And he worked with it, and he worked with it, and he worked with it, and it clicked, and it clicked, and it clicked. But he couldn't get the light to come on. He couldn't get the fire to come on. And he said, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to get someone to come out and service this. Something stopped up somewhere. I won't be able to do this today. He couldn't get the light to come on. Well, when we think about the advent of Christ, the coming of Jesus Christ, Jesus came to bring the light back. Jesus came to bring the fire of God back. Jesus came to bring the shine back that we have lost because of sin. So when Jesus comes into this world, when He came into this world, 
He came to bring the light of God so that we can see who God is and what God is really like and so we can find ourselves who are lost. Now, have you ever tried to look for something that, that you couldn't find in the dark? Have you ever tried to find it without a light? You may or may not have succeeded depending on how closely you could determine where you had dropped whatever it is you're trying to find. But we all know it's easier to find if you've got a light, right? We are lost in sin and the light of Christ enables us not only to see God, but to see ourselves for who we are as sinners and to see how we can find ourselves in Him and to be renewed in Him. John tells us that Jesus was the Word. And the Word was with God. So when it says the Word was with God, that tells you right there that the Word was separate in some sense from God, and in this case, God the Father is who John is talking about. He later clarifies he's talking about the Father. God the Father is in some sense distinct from this uh, Logos, this word that John is talking about. And he is with God, but at the same time, John goes on to say, but the word also was God. Now this is the basic building blocks of what we call the doctrine of the Trinity here. And this eternal word, this word that was with the Father, was the means, the agent through which God created everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Because it goes on to say, just so we don't misunderstand, John wants us to know that there was not one thing that was created or made that was made without the Word. Did you catch that? Right? So if you think about it on these terms, if you think about dividing up all of reality into two dimensions, basically, if you think about God, the eternal creator on one side, and creation that has a beginning on the other side are all creatures, in terms of the Word, the Word that He is talking about is on the side of the creator. The eternal creator through whom God the Father created all things. God spoke and everything through His Word leaped into existence. Right? So this eternal Word that was completely and fully divine, John tells us, became flesh, he says in verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And it's John who came to bear witness about Him, to bear witness about this One that John also calls the light. The light who was to come into the world. Plain and simply, John also tells us that Jesus was born. When it says the Word became flesh, that would have began at the moment of conception. The moment Jesus was conceived in the womb of Mary, that's when the Word became flesh through the power of the Holy Spirit. So John doesn't really give us a birth story, if you will, but he really kind of does when he says the Word became flesh. But he also lets us know that quite simply the reason that Jesus came, the reason that Jesus was born is so that we may be born again. He was born that we may be born again. Listen to what he says here in verse Uh, 11 again. He says, I'm going to pick up verse 10. He says, He was in the world and the world was made through Him. Again, going back to what He's already said, yet the world did not know Him. Did not recognize Him for who He truly was. He came to His own people and His own people did not receive Him. John is telling us here that God Himself in the person of Jesus Christ came to the world and that He had made and the world didn't recognize Him and He came to His own people that He had a special covenant relationship with and they would not receive Him as this later He will tell us as the story 
The rest of the whole Gospel of John is basically just an unpacking in detail of what he tells us here in this first half of chapter 1. So, but he goes on to say, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right or the power to become children of God, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He was born and he came so that we could be born again. And we're going to unpack this over the next couple of weeks even more as we go. This is at the heart of what John's message is all about for us today, for all the world. He was born that we might be born again. We need new birth because of sin. Sin brings the fire back into our lives. It lights the, the fire again in our souls so that we can once again reflect the light of God the way He originally intended for us to reflect the light of God out into the world. It's sin and rebellion that puts a damper on the light and it keeps the light of God from reflecting from us the way God originally intended. When God created us in His image, you can kind of think about the image of God kind of like a mirror. We were designed and created to reflect the light of God into the world and to bless all of creation through that. And sin brings the uh, what John Wesley called the image of the devil into our lives. We're, we're uh, just bound in pride and self-will. And things get out of whack and the light doesn't shine through us the way God originally intended it. There's an evangelist, a Methodist evangelist I heard talking one time, and he's actually preached here at this church it's maybe about 10 years ago now, a guy named Reverend Terry Duckworth. Anybody remember Terry Duckworth? Well, Terry Duckworth's got this little thing where he, he tells people that they need to be uh, reflect the light of Jesus. And he tells people, you know, what you need to do is you need to go out into the world and you need to moon people for Jesus. And once he gets their attention with that, he says, now what I mean is, get your mind out of the gutter, what I mean is, just like the moon reflects the light of the sun, you need to go out into the world and reflect the light of Christ into the world. So we're to take the light of God and reflect it out. But because of sin in our lives and the corruption of sin in our lives, instead of being like the moon, we're kind of like the black holes of the universe. And the black holes, they take the light and absorb them into themselves, right? It's misdirected. And the light can't escape the black hole, right? And everything in its path is brought within to its vortex, not even light can escape. And that's the power of sin. Jesus came into this world that we may be born again to bring the fire back and to bring the shine back into our lives. See, our reason, our minds and our reason gets clouded and distorted through our corrupted passions, our corrupted desires. God designed our reason, though, that thing that we make decisions with, he designed our reason to be in subjection to the Spirit of God. And He designed our passions to be in subjection to our reason. And what sin does is it makes all of that out of order. It takes all of that puts it out of whack so that our reason becomes a slave to our passion. That doesn't mean that we, don't, that we no longer have any reasoning and abilities. We just use our reason. We use our reason for the wrong purposes. <coughs> It's called rationalization. We do things because we want to do things and then we self-justify. We self-justify what it is we want to do. We get, in, we get caught in what I call this self-justification loop. We do something out of passion, out of anger maybe, or out of wrath, or, or out of lust, or greed, or something, whatever you want to call it, and then, then we come up with reasons for why it's okay that we did that. We make excuses. We a lot of times, I'll just watch Jerry Springer. Well, don't watch Jerry Springer. Okay? Really don't watch Jerry Springer. I can't believe that show's still on, but it's still on. After I don't know how many years. I, I heard the other day, I saw this thing where they've actually done an opera in New York or something based on the Jerry Springer show. My goodness. 
But so we get caught in this rationalization loop and we're using our reason to justify our passions when our reason is not in subjection to the will of God and the Spirit of God in our lives. And we can just, you can think about how this works. It works in our lives every day if we allow it to. You know, I've got a good friend of mine. I, he, he's a wonderful guy. I and mean, he's just one of these guys that, uh, you know, you couldn't ever imagine him losing his temper. Just couldn't ever imagine. But he was talking about a few years back, he's working, he's working in a, a church that's he's an associate pastor, pretty big church, and he starts playing in this uh, men's basketball league. There's a lot of young people playing in the basketball league, maybe the YMCA or something. Might have been a church league, I'm not sure. But he's playing and he's on a team and everybody knows he's a preacher. Everybody in the whole league knows he's a preacher playing in this league. Well, he's in this game and he said, there's a guy on this other team and this guy's playing dirty. He's elbowing people. He's tripping people like Grace and Al. Uh, he's uh, he's <laughs> trash talking. He's you know trying to stoke uh, people up and, and, and to do all these dirty things. And, and Alan, you know, he just, that's the nicest guy you've ever met. He's just, just welling up in He starts to feel it in his belly. And it starts to rise up into his heart. And it eventually comes out of his mouth and it goes into his fist. And uh, he's sat there on, he's sitting there like this on the free throw line. This guy's shooting free throws and this guy starts yelling at him or saying something uh, bad to him. And Alan said, I just, I lost him. I just lost it. And here's the preacher saying, he's bucking up to this guy and he's trying to get him and he's trying to get him to go outside with him. And he said, there's people that are grabbing him and hanging on to him and trying to pull him back and trying to keep him from doing what he's getting ready to do. And he said, he wasn't, he wasn't listening to any reason. And he was coming up with all kinds of reasons why he was going to take his fellow outside and give him what for. He lost it, he said. What was it that he lost? A lot of times we say we lost our minds, right? Our reason, his reason became the slave of his passion. And eventually, after a while, it came, he came to his senses and like, oh my goodness, what was I thinking? Well, the problem is he wasn't thinking. That can happen to any of us, right? And some people can live in that state if for, for the whole entirety of their lives and coming up with all kinds of reasons. But while they're justified in this bitterness and this anger and this rancor that they have in their lives towards other people. They're just mad at the world, right? And it could be our lust or it could be greed or whatever that can overcome our reason and allow us to use our reason to do things we know we shouldn't do. And cloud our minds so that we make poor decisions and then continue to try to justify those things. That's what Jesus came into this world to set straight and set right, to put back in order. We'll read uh, something to you from 1 John here. 1 John definitely related to the Gospel of John, and it's written in the same spirit as the Gospel of John, and it unpacks some of the same truths uh, that the Gospel of John gives us. Here uh, in chapter 2, 1 John says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, see this is misdirected love. This is love that's designed for God being directed to the world, the things of the world, the creation rather than the Creator. And he's saying, For the love of the Father is not in him. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh... The desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So he breaks this down into three dimensions. He calls it the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh is basically just living for pleasure, self-gratification. Just living for pleasure. That's the way John Wesley described this. And then lust of the eyes, listen to this now. Lust of the eyes is living for novelty. This is what John, how John Wesley described it, and I think he was right on target here. Living for what's new rather than for what is true. 
And this is where the temptation of boredom comes into play. People get bored and they begin to seek after something that seems new. But what seems new is really not new at all. It's the same old sin just reconstituted in a different package, right? So we get bored with what's true and we seek after what's new or what we think is new instead. The desire for new things, the desire for novelty. This is one of the major things that has ruined the church in so many ways in America today. Because of some seeking after something new, because we, we have thought of worship as if it's all about us and about what we like and about what we don't like and, and what kind of uh, music we want to hear and what kind of things we want to hear in the sermons and so on and so forth. And we have just redefined everything to center around ourselves so we're at the center of everything and we're drawing everything into ourselves because we think it's all about us. Does that sound like that black hole I was describing earlier? Really? The desire for something new rather than what is true because we get bored with the truth. We get bored with the truth. So we have to fight off that temptation of boredom. But you end up with worship services designed to feed the flesh rather than to feed our spirit. You're designed, you end up with worship services in the church that are designed to tickle goat ears rather than to feed the sheep. And there's a big difference. When it becomes all about entertainment and worship looks more like a concert than actual people gathering to praise and to worship God who is to be at the center. We need to change positions, right? And then 1 John tells us the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and then the pride of life. Now this is simply living for the praise of people rather than living, living for the praise of God. And this is related to what I just said. Living for the praise of people rather than living for the praise of God. And we see, and I see this play out on social media. It's a sad thing to see. But uh, on social media, people live for the likes that they get on their social media posts. And there's a guy, he, he is very concerned as a researcher in this field. He is incredibly concerned because he thinks that the right, you know, the life expectancy we just found out this past week or so, the life expectancy in the United States has dropped. One of the main reasons is because of suicide and opioid addiction, drug addiction. Are you with me today? People are depressed, and there's one guy, he, he, he thinks that a large, and a lot, lot of it is among young people, young teenagers, that it's not getting the likes or being uh, led to believe that, that everyone else's life is great because, you know, I don't post the bad stuff on social media, but don't you, th don't you think there's not any bad stuff in my life or any bad stuff going on in my household? Don't think that we don't ever lose our temper or say things that we shouldn't say or do things that we shouldn't do. So we've got to be careful living for the praise, living for the likes rather than living for the love of God in Jesus Christ. Okay? And living for the praise of God rather than the praise of me. See, there's a lot of folks, they're, they're doing a lot of things that really in and of themselves are good things but they're doing them for the wrong reasons. Instead of for the glory of God, it is to bring glory to themselves. So Jesus comes into our life to set all of these things straight, to heal us from these things so that our lust can be turned into the luster of God again, so that we can live for the praise of God rather than the praise of people again. So Jesus comes into this world as the light of this world to bring the shine back. To bring the fire of God back into our lives so that we can reflect what God really and truly wants us to reflect. It's a restoration project, if you will. It's a restoration project like this car I've got up here. Uh, this Mustang that's been taken from the junkyard to the car shed, right? To bring the shine back into now from an equal opportunity preacher. I didn't want to leave the Chevy folks out today. So uh, we've got a, a 50, I guess that's a 50 something Chevy there, so I can probably tell me what it is. I'm not a car expert. But Jesus brings the shine back 
in our lives. He brings the fire of God and the shine back into our lives, but we got to receive Him. We have to receive. And it's not just a one-time momentary receiving through faith. It's an ongoing faith that we have in Jesus Christ to bring the shine back into our lives so we can reflect the light of God. He came into this world that we might be born again, that we might be regenerated, that we might be renewed by the power of God to become something greater than we already are. And we're kind of like, we're not kind of like the mechanic here. Don't think of ourselves like the mechanic and the body, the body shop guy who's going to make this car look better. We're not in the position of the body shop owner. We're in the position of the car. And that car can't fix itself, can it? We can't fix ourselves. It's only something we have to receive from somebody else. And we need more than just the shine. If we're going to have the shine, we've got to also have something under the hood too, right? You want the car with the shine without the thing that's going to make it, the fire that's going to really make it go on the road. So we need the fire back so we can have the shine back in our lives and Jesus brings the fire and He brings the shine. That's what Christmas is all about. He was born that we may be born again. Now I know many of you have already you already started doing your decorations? Yeah. You got your Christmas trees up? Yeah. Yes. You got your lights on your trees? You got your lights going on the houses? In the windows? Yeah. Beautiful time of year, isn't it? To drive by at night and to see all of the lights that you see. I mean, I drove by one house the other night coming back from uh, Alexander County, and I was just like, wow. It looked like one of those really crazy looking suits that you can buy for Christmas. It just got all kinds of credit. The whole house looked like that. It was just incredible. Griswolds. It had to be the Griswolds. <laughs> it was incredible. I couldn't believe it. As beautiful, though, or as gaudy as some of these Christmas lights can be, the most important Christmas light that someone can see and someone needs to see this year it's not going to be on somebody's house. It's not going to be in somebody's window. It's not going to be on somebody's tree. It's going to be the light of Christ in you and in me. That rhymes and I didn't mean to do that, right? Alright? Amen? Amen? That's the most important light that somebody needs to see this year. So rather than greed, generosity, rather than hate, love, rather than falsehood, truth for me and from you. We're the Christmas lights. We're the Christmas lights that people really need to see. To see the light of Christ in us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for bringing the fire back, for bringing the light back, for making a way for us to be changed, to be transformed, to be reordered, to be set right, and to be made new. Lord, you give us the power to become more than we already are. You give us the power to be restored through faith and trust in you. Lord, you're the great mechanic. Lord, you're the great body worker. Lord, you're the one who can do any and everything. May we shine brightly this Christmas season, Lord, so that others may see the light of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as you're able as we close out today.